Now this evening, as I mentioned, we're continuing in Psalm 119, and we're going to be looking at, um, well, I'm not sure what number section this is, but we're going to be looking at verses 57 through 64, verses 57 through 64. And again, each of these sections has a particular, oh, something that's unique about it, uh, something we might say that might be the emphasis of that particular section. Some of them have to do with uh, the blessings that come to us in our obedience. Some of them have to do with just the love the psalmist expresses for the law of God, which all of us should share if we are, in fact, uh, born again by the Spirit of God. Uh, this particular one certainly expresses that love and desire to serve the Lord, but it also gives to us, I think, ways in which we might love Him more, serve Him more, and be de more devoted to Him. And particularly a warning against, uh, well, maybe not so much a warning, but an implied warning against what it is that might undo more quickly the work that we're seeking to do and that the Lord is seeking to do in our lives, and that is by keeping bad company. Of course, what He encourages us to do is to keep good company, and that's really what we need. Well, let's read this section as we begin. Uh, Psalm 119, verses 57 through 64. He says, The Lord is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. I sought your favor with all my heart to be gracious to me according to your word. I considered my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. I hastened and did not delay to keep your commandments. The cords of the wicked have encircled me, but I have not forgotten your law. At midnight I shall rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous ordinances. I am a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. The earth is full of your loving kindness, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Well, may the Lord bless again this portion of His Word to encourage us to devote ourselves to the Lord, even as Jesus devoted Himself to the Father, even as His example calls us to devote ourselves to Him, which is, again, what we saw this morning. Remember, we need to fasten our eyes upon Jesus Christ. We need continually to look to Him. We need to look beyond the world to Him and see Him continually before us, see Him as our only means of salvation, to see Him as our only source of strength, to see Him as our heart's desire, and to see Him as the example which we are to follow. Remember that God, well, actually Jesus Christ has given Himself to us. The Father gave us His Son so that we might do this. You know, it's funny, this, this is a command, isn't it? That we are to give ourselves and devote ourselves to the Lord in this way, but let's not forget that it's also a privilege uh, to be able to do it, uh, because the people of this world who are apart from God's grace have no desire for these things, and if they continue in that state, they're going to be destroyed. But God has given us that desire that we might do this. He's given us His Spirit that we may desire this. He's given us so many things uh, to strengthen us and to help us in this way. But as I mentioned uh, this morning and already this evening, that there is something here too that uh, we need to understand that will either help us or hinder us in doing what it is the Lord has called us to do. And that is the kind of company that we will keep. Uh, godly friends will draw you closer to the Lord. That's the one of the reasons why the Lord tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It's one of the reasons why we, uh, we fellowship why we meet midweek, why we have what we call Christian you know, community, society, uh, why we spend time with one another uh, because of the, the faith that each of us has, because of the, the fire or the warmth in our hearts for the Lord Jesus Christ as we meet together and we actually express that love for Him and for each other. It helps to strengthen our love for Him and for one another. Godly friends, the saints, the fellowship, the communion of the, of the, of the saints can be a great blessing to us. But on the other hand, ungodly friends can really undo all of that just as easily, sadly. 
And what we need to see this evening is that you and I need to adopt the attitude of the psalmist in this regard and what it is that, that he desired because this is the attitude the Lord wants each of us to have. Now, again, each of these verses really gives to us something uh, different. And I do think that there is a logical progression. Sometimes it almost seems like the psalmist is just making these random comments about the law of God, you know. But actually, these all tie together, I think, in a very logical way. Now, he begins in this section by declaring what is most precious to him in this world. Interestingly enough, that fits very well with what we saw this morning. Remember, fastening our eyes on Jesus Christ. If He isn't precious to you, if He is not what you desire, if He's not what you aspire to be like, if He is not your hero, you're not going to be able to do what the psalmist is calling you to do or what the Lord is calling you to do through the psalmist. So he declares what is most precious to him in all of creation, in this whole world. He says, the Lord is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. This is the difference between the believer and the unbeliever. And that is what it is that he loves in this world, what it is he hopes to take out of this world. You know, the people of the world are completely the opposite of the children of light. Their portion, their share, the thing that they are seeking after and expecting to take out of this life is really only what they can get from this world and out of this world while, while they're here. This is really all they can see and all that they strive for. David writes in Psalm 17, verses 13 through 14, Deliver my soul from the wicked with your sword, from men with your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life. That's what distinguishes, you see, the, again, the people of the world from the people of God because the people of the world love this world. This is their portion. This is what they want. And, of course, they're going to try to get everyone out of the way that gets in their way. But it should be different for you. It should be different for me if we're believers here this evening because the world is not our portion. We know that those who love the world are going to perish with the world, right? Right? If you're a Christian here this evening, if you're a believer, the Lord is your portion. The Lord is your share. The Lord is your inheritance. He is really all that you desire in this world and all that you desire after this world. And, of course, He is also what, what it is you live for while you are here. Now, you know that that calls you to live differently than the people of this world. It calls you to live by a different standard because the standard by which you please the Lord and gain Him is quite a bit different than gaining the things of the world. So as the psalmist, as we saw again this morning, you have promised to keep His words. As you love the Lord Jesus Christ and fasten your eyes upon Him, you are to follow Him as your example. You are to devote yourself to Him, to do what is pleasing in, in His sight. Again, in everything that has to do with His Word. If you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you will listen to His Word. You'll believe what He tells you. You'll embrace His promises. You will tremble when He threatens. And, of course, you will obey His commandments because that is what you want to do. This is really the commission you took up when you decided to answer the call of the gospel, again, by God's grace, to receive Jesus Christ not only as your Savior, but also as your Lord. And you cannot have one without the other. But if you have embraced Him as your Savior, you want Him as your Lord. That's not something that is a burden to you. Remember, we saw again this morning when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And the reason is because you desire it on you. And again, that's what the psalmist says. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words because that's what he desires. Now, to gain the power to do this, you do need to pray and seek the Lord. That's one of the means by which he will give you the strength to do this. You need to seek Him for His favor, for His blessing. But the psalmist gives us a key here. He says in verse 58, I have sought your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your word. Now again, if you are to receive the power to seek the Lord in this way, to love Him as your only portion, 
to be able to keep His words. You do have to seek Him, but you need to see the intensity with which you are to seek Him. It cannot be half-heartedly. As if it didn't matter to you whether the Lord answers or not. I don't know if you've, um, uh, when you pray and you ask for certain things, whether you ever look for the answer to those prayers. I mean, sometimes we're so caught up in praying for all the different needs around us and we look maybe sometimes for the answers to those prayers. We should be looking expectantly for those things. But when you pray especially that the Lord might grant to you His favor, where He might bless you with the ability, the greater love to keep His word, do you ever look for that in your heart? Do you look for that greater love? And when you seek it, do you really want it? Do you really desire it? Are you doing this with all your heart? You know, when you do that, it shows the Lord the fact that you sincerely want these things. Because if you ask God for His blessings, I mean, the Bible tells us in one place, if you doubt that He's going to answer this, he's, you're not going to get anything. But another thing that can hinder your prayers is if you really don't want what you're asking for, if your heart is divided, if you're not earnestly seeking it because it is what you truly desire, the Lord won't give it to you. You must desire it, and of course, you must desire it for His glory. And I think in, until we can do that, the Lord is not really going to give us what we'd want until we're prepared to receive it. So when we seek the Lord, we need to seek Him with a wholeness of heart and a desire that God would answer these prayers. But I do think there's something else He's telling us here that when we seek Him in this way, we also need to seek Him according to His Word because He says, be gracious to me according to your Word, which means you need to be looking to the things that God has promised. He prays that God would give him what He said that He would. Now, when you ask God for what it is He has already promised to give you, you can be sure that you will receive it, but you do need to, be, you need to make sure that your prayers are anchored by these two things, by His promise and by your heart. You have to desire it, and you have to ask for what He has promised. And if you do that in the name of Jesus Christ, He will give it to you. But again, don't expect to receive it unless you really desire it. Now, how is it that you can desire these things more? How can you seek the Lord with a whole heart? Well, the psalmist says that there's something that you must be willing to give up at the same time if the Lord is going to hear your prayers and if He's going to answer them, and that is your sins. Notice he says in verse 59, I considered my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. Now, again, we said doubt is one thing that might hinder us from receiving what we ask. And, of course, if we ask for things that God hasn't promised to give us, that can hinder us. If we don't ask with a whole heart, that can also uh, keep us from receiving the Lord's blessing. But if there is sin in our lives, any sin that we're not willing to give up, then God has told us quite plainly that He's not going to answer us. I mean, how can you pray with all your heart if in your heart you're holding on to something that is displeasing to him if your heart is divided. The Lord says through Isaiah the prophet, again, a very familiar passage, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. If you are to seek the Lord for His blessing, if He is to be gracious to you according to His will, not only must you have a heart, well, again, no doubt, and seek Him according to His promises, but your heart must not be divided between Him and something that He hates. So you need to examine your life to make sure that there is nothing that you are doing, nothing you are desiring, nothing you are thinking, nothing you are saying that is dishonoring to Him. Remember what we saw this morning and what we saw on Friday, no compromise. If you are the Lord's servant, He will hear you. But where you find that your heart is divided, 
The psalmist says that you need to turn away from that back into the paths of His commandments. The same thing the author to the Hebrews told us. As we set our eyes upon Jesus Christ, we need to lay aside the sin that entangles us, the things that encumber us. We need to run the race remembering that God is faithful to discipline us. And so if we find that uh, our knees are weak and, and our arms are feeble and so forth, we need to make straight paths for our feet. Otherwise, the Lord will discipline us until we do turn. But again, He will do it out of love. Now, fourthly, the psalmist tells us that you need to do this without delay. Where you find something in your life that is out of accord with what He desires of you, you need to put it off now and not until another day. That's one of the problems when we do search our hearts and we do find something in us that we know isn't pleasing to the Lord. We don't set all of our strength to, to put it off right away or put it to death, but oftentimes we procrastinate. The psalmist says this in verse 60, I hastened and did not delay to keep your commandments. You know, good intentions to reform your life is, is good, but if they never actually work their way into your actions, they won't do you any good. Now, if the Lord is to hear you, you do have to repent of your sins and you have to do it now. Put off every sin. Put on every duty. Again, how can you seek the Lord with all your heart when your heart is divided between Him and something He hates, between Him and His enemy, between Him and something that is your enemy as well? Now, fifthly, he says, you must be willing to do this even if you are surrounded by those who would tempt you to do otherwise. Verse 61, the cords of the wicked have encircled me, but I have not forgotten your law. You know, it's funny, isn't it? But really not funny. It's not strange that this coincides so well with what we've been looking at on not only on Wednesday, but on Friday and also what we saw this morning. And as I thought about this particular verse, I thought about the situation that Eric Little was in. The idea of the pressure that he was feeling that was coming, you know, to him from his country. National pride from his team. You know, we want to win gold medals so that, you know, we can come out on top. Uh, his coach, you're sure you're doing the right thing? Is it really that big of a deal, Eric, that you can't run on, on Sunday? The athletic committee, it's time to set aside your conscience. You need to put a uh, king before God, the Prince of Wales. And we saw that even when he was a prisoner by the Japanese, when he was a missionary in China, and he was put in charge of the athletic activities that were taking place there, that he refused to plan any of them for Sunday. He refused to compromise. Now, all of these who were putting pressure on him uh, didn't appear to be Christians. And if they weren't Christians, then biblically speaking, they were what the Bible calls wicked men, enemies of God, children of wrath, those who live and walk according to the prince of this world. And they could not understand why little could not set aside his conscience for what they consider to be more important, a higher purpose. But you see, there is nothing higher than obedience to God. So the cords of the wicked encircle little, but he did not forget God's law because he loved his Lord, Jesus Christ, and was devoted to him. And neither should you forget it. If you are a believer, you too are devoted to Him. You love Him more than anything else. And so, regardless of the temptations that will come to you to compromise, you will not do it. Now, realizing what a treasure the Lord had entrusted to Him as far as His commandments, that it showed Him how to love and honor the one who loved Him. It's interesting. He says this, At midnight I shall rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous ordinances. Now, why would the psalmist get up at midnight? What would get him up at midnight? I don't think they had alarm clocks in those days. I don't think he set his alarm clock to wake him up in the middle of the night and to give thanks to the Lord. But I think what's happening here is that the psalmist was just so thrilled to be able to have God's law. Again, something, sadly, that, that in the church today is, is looked at with such uh, negativity, with such aspersion. 
that he was so excited to have it, the thought of it. If he would wake up in the middle of the night, the thought of having such a blessing entrusted to him, which Moses said on one occasion, what nation is there under heaven that has been so blessed by God to have such great laws as you have? The thought of this would flood his mind and flood his heart to the point where he couldn't sleep until he rose and gave thanks to the Lord for these mercies, for giving him such a blessing. Now, have you ever had that kind of experience? And I'm sure we all have, especially when we're children, and it's Christmas Eve, and we're trying to get to sleep, you know, because the next day is Christmas. We're so thrilled, we're so excited, we can't wait. And so it's the longest night of the year. I don't know if you remember that as children. It was so difficult to sleep on that particular night. And if if you would happen to fall asleep, you know, it wouldn't be long before you wake up, and as soon as you woke up, the thought of the next day being Christmas would just flood your mind, and you'd get this adrenaline rush, and suddenly you'd be wide awake, and you couldn't sleep any longer. Well, that's what it's like when you're excited about something. That's the kind of excitement that the psalmist had in his relationship with the Lord and with the law that the Lord had given to him, the, the excitement he had over having this and the prospect of being able to keep it and being able to do what was pleasing to the one that he loved most of all. Now, that's the kind of love that the Lord says that he wants you to have. That's the kind of love that he has given to you. And hopefully, as you learn more about the Lord and as you grow in your love for him and you uh, come to understand that what he requires in his law is really something that is good, very good, very loving, very gracious, that is perfect, that you will have that same kind of excitement in your relationship with him and in the prospect of being able to serve him in this way so that you can't sleep either. When you wake up, just to think about all those blessings which just suddenly rouse you out of your sleep and you can't really get back to sleep until you've spent time just thanking God. For his mercies. Now, again, this, this is the psalmist's relationship with the Lord. This is his desire to serve him, his desire to turn away from everything contrary to him, his, his desire, you know, not to compromise under any circumstances. But now, as I said before, I think he addresses something that can either be a great blessing to us to help us to grow in this area, or it can be perhaps something that can undo everything that, that these other things can do. It's a danger that he was keenly aware of, that we're warned of throughout Scripture, and something you should be aware of as well, and something you should, of course, avoid, as well as something you should seek. Now, what you should avoid is bad company, and what you should seek is godly company. Again, he says this, I am a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. And he, he desires that kind of companionship because of the help that it will give to him. Now, let's realize, first of all, as we saw in our meditation, that there is a danger in bad company. Paul writes, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And again, Greg drew our attention to the first four words, do not be deceived, because we are deceived in this area. So often we think that we're strong enough to resist the influence others have on us. Others may fall, but I'm not going to fall. I say I'm stronger than that. I love the Lord more than that. So I can mix with these people. It's not going to bother me. Well, the problem is if that is what you think, you actually are the one most likely to fall. Solomon writes in Proverbs 16 verse 18, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before stumbling. You know, it's interesting, that particular verse is quoted two other times in the New Testament, once by James and once by Peter, because it's true. Of course, they could quote any portion of the Bible, of course it's true. But many have thought that they would be able to stand. Many have believed what their hearts have told them, rather than believing what God says. But the psalmist was not a fool. When we trust our hearts, then we are fools. He knew that what God said was true, even though his heart would say otherwise. He knew that his own heart was as the Lord said in Jeremiah 17, 9, more deceitful 
than all else and desperately sick. We cannot trust our own hearts. We saw that in Pilgrim's Progress. Ignorance trusted his own heart with regard to what it said about himself and about his life. I know that I'm doing what's right because my heart tells me so. I know I'm right with the Lord because my heart tells me so. I know that Jesus is going to receive me because my heart tells me so. Well, what heart is that? The one that is deceitful above all else and desperately sick. You cannot trust your heart. You have to trust what the Word of God says. And it says, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And so instead of picking his friends based on their popularity or how much fun it would be to be around them or how good they made him feel or how they made him look, he chose his companions based on their godly character. I am a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. And again, we saw the example of King David in the psalm that we read for our call to worship. David wanted to make sure that his life was pleasing to the Lord. He wanted to make sure when he governed God's people that he did it righteously and honoringly to the Lord. And so in order to do that, he made sure the people who were around him were the ones who would encourage him to do that. Psalm 101, here's a few verses, verses 3 through 7. And again, a wonderful example. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. What does that say about the heroes of this world? I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. No one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. He who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. Sounds to me like David didn't want the wicked in his presence. Sounds to me like David wanted those who feared the Lord and who kept his commandments. Now, that's, again, not just an Old Testament principle, but even if it were just in the Old Testament, it's still one we'd have to pay attention to because it's, that's what God wants. It's what He desires. But we also have in the New Testament that reinforced by the Apostle Paul who warns us of an unequal yoke, of being in close relationships with the children of this world. He tells us that we are to come out from among them and be separate. Again, it doesn't mean that we can't you know, love them and seek to bring them to Christ and try to influence them and interact with them for that purpose, but we are not to make them our close friends. If you want to love the Lord more, if you want to have a heart more devoted to Him, you need to seek the kind of friends that are going to help you to do this, those who fear Him, those who turn away from evil, those who don't follow the immoral practices of this world, but those who have heaven in their hearts and are going that direction. They have set their hearts to obey Him. Now, again, this is the kind of man, woman, the child that the Lord wants you to be and, you know, to, to be that kind of companion for others so that you may influence them in the same way. Uh, the singles among us who, um, you know, are those who aren't married, this is the kind of man or woman that you should be seeking the kind you would have for a spouse, those that fear the Lord and that desire to do His will. It's sad to say that there's, you know, this kind of companion, this kind of friendship is becoming increasingly hard to find in this world, but by God's grace, He always has that remnants that are His. Sometimes we see hundreds, thousands of people in churches, but very few of them actually would meet these qualifications. So we need to make sure we seek after that kind of companion, and we need to make sure that we are that kind of companion. Now, the fact that there are such people in the world, as the psalmist thinks about it, and many other blessings that he has given moves him to desire even more strongly to obey the Lord. Again, because of thankfulness for God's mercies, but also perhaps that he might be the kind of companion that others need to encourage them to serve the Lord as well. So he says in verse 64, 
The earth is full of your loving kindness, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. And really, all of these blessings should have the same effect upon you to strengthen your desire to do God's will. And so basically, I want us just maybe for a moment to summarize what it is we've seen over the past few days because all of these things really work together, I think, to help us. We really do need to ask this question. Do you want to live a life that is honoring to the Lord? The kind of life that you will have wanted to live when you finally do stand before the Lord on the day of His judgment. And what kind of life do you want to live? Well, I hope it's the kind that is honoring to the Lord. I hope it's the kind that pleases Him. The kind that expresses that wholehearted devotion that we saw this morning. Well, how can you live that kind of life? First of all, you need to fix your eyes upon Jesus, and again, as we saw this evening, to make Him your only portion in this life, the thing you desire the most. What, you know, what have I in heaven but you, and besides you I desire nothing on earth, the psalmist says. He should be your portion. He should be your only desire. And certainly, there are other things, of course, that you'll desire, the fellowship of the saints the, and uh, you know, various things you need for your livelihood. But they should be so far distant, and He should be so prominent that He is your only portion. See Him as the only thing that's important, the only thing you're going to take out of this world, the only thing you're going to possess for eternity. He needs to be your portion. Secondly, look to Him for, for His strength, that He might daily strengthen the work of His Holy Spirit within your heart. Remember, the kingdom of heaven, in a certain sense, is within you. The kingdom of God in the sense of the Spirit of God, He is your source of strength. You need Him, but in order to receive more of Him, you do need to ask God for His blessing. I sought your favor with all my heart. This is the favor you need more than anything else, that portion of His Holy Spirit. But you need to seek Him with all of your heart. You must really desire Him and more of Him because if you don't, as we've already seen, God's not going to give what you're asking for. He has promised to give you His Spirit. He's commanded you to be filled with the Spirit. You have some desire for it, but you need to put that lack of desire that's there, that sin to death, and desire it more strongly. And as you do and seek the Lord, He will give it to you. You need to make Jesus Christ your hero. You need to love Him more. You need to love Him most of all. You need to be excited as we saw the psalmist rising up at midnight and so forth, you need to be excited when you awake that he's your first thought and that you have a relationship with him, that he is your child, or that you are his child, excuse me, and that you have the opportunity to serve him in this world. That is a tremendous blessing. It should excite you. And of course, you should devote yourself to him and to his word. Don't leave any room in your life for compromise. Even if you're pressured by those around you, even as Eric Little was, even by the whole nation, even by kings and princes, even if the whole world should abandon, or I should say the whole church because the world doesn't know Christ, but even if the whole church should abandon Him, you will not do that. And where you find any area in your life that weakens you, any compromise, that you would immediately repent without delay and make straight paths for your feet. Use your gifts as the Lord gives them to you, again, to bring glory to Him and not to yourself. Remember, live your whole life for Him. Be devoted to Him. Seek to bring glory to Him. And then finally, let's not forget again the burden of the message this evening. I think at least the main point that I wanted you to see or one of the prominent points. Don't forget about the very real danger that ungodly friends pose to you. They can derail your walk with the Lord faster than just about anything else. You know, it is interesting that that, that is the thing that we have to contend with as adults more than anything else. That's the thing that, we have to, that, our, that our youth have to contend with, is that there are so few that are seeking the Lord, and the more that don't, the more we're encouraged not to. But we need to make sure that 
we are the kind of person who don't rely on these other people exclusively. We need to rely upon the Lord and be devoted to Him so that we can encourage others to, uh, well, to be what the Lord would have them to be. But we also need to seek out, because we do need this encouragement, we need to seek out those who are honoring the Lord, seeking to glorify Him. We need to be aware that, yeah, you know, even if the whole church should abandon the Lord, that that is not an excuse for us to do so. We must hold fast to the Lord. So don't forget they can encourage you. Bad company can encourage you to turn away from the Lord. It can encourage you to compromise. It can seek, well, basically it can undo everything again that I've already mentioned, everything the psalmist has mentioned, everything the Lord wants you to be by way of bad example, bad peer pressure can do these things to you. And, you know, as parents, that's the reason why when our children are growing up, we're very careful to make sure that they mix with uh, children that aren't going to influence them, you know, to do something we don't want them to do. And again, we were all children once, and we understand what that's like. I remember falling uh, into a friendship with somebody who was a bad influence on me. And I did things that I never would have done if I had not had that person as a friend. And you know, the lights come on later and you see that kind of thing. Well, of course, as parents, we try to keep our children from forming those kinds of relationships. But you know what? We eventually grow up. And we have to start making those choices for ourselves. Our children need to start making those choices for themselves. You need to make sure that you choose the best kind of friends. Those who fear God. Those who keep His commandments. And don't forget that these things that we're looking at, these principles, are not you know, just suggestions you can either you know, take or leave. The outcome of your life depends largely on what you do with these things. This isn't an automatic ride to heaven. The Lord has not made it so that, you know, like, well, as many believe, just pray the sinner's prayer or just trust in the Lord and then you just kick into automatic and do whatever you want to do and you're just going to end up in heaven. It's going to be the same for everyone. So what difference does it make? That's not the way the Lord has made things. He's made it so that we need to seek Him and we need to be striving forward. We need to be putting our sins to death. We need to... Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for our flesh. We need to race toward heaven as one seeking to win. There is effort we have to put in. And if we don't do it, it just simply means the Lord has never taken hold of our hearts. We don't really love Him. Because if we did, we would do what He calls us to do because that's what we want to do. The outcome of our life depends largely on what we will do with these things. If you want to honor the Lord, then you must do them. You must do them. You want to do them. You will do them. And to the degree that you do them, to that degree, you will be blessed. So may the Lord give us grace to listen to all of these things. And again, it's not enough to know them. They need to actually come in connection with our lives. We need actually to do these things. So may God give us the grace to do that. Let's uh, bow in a, in a few moments of prayer and ask for Him or for His grace to do that.